welcome back to another episode of the Sacred Sisterhood Podcast. On this week's episode, I have a special guest, Samantha Baldwin from Goddess Reiki YYC. Now, this interview in which we will be exploring working with the goddess is also streamed live onto my Facebook business page, which if you prefer to watch the video, you can do so at www.facebook.com slash coach Mary ends. And the interview took place on May 3rd, 2020. Or you can just dive in right here, right now and listen to the audio version. So enjoy this conversation, grab a cup of coffee or pour yourself a glass of wine and receive. There's so much powerful wisdom that is within this conversation that will really activate you and stir up within you the feminine, the beautiful divine feminine within you. So enjoy. Okay, so we have Samantha Baldwin here from Goddess Reiki YYC, and we are here to have a beautiful conversation about how she birthed goddess reiki school as well as how one can work with the goddess so thank you for those of you that were waiting for like an hour for us to go live we were just having a little chat and time got away on us we were you know solving all the world's mysteries (laughs) that's true we did a lot of work in an hour there was a lot there's a lot that happened there so sam why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and how you came to be in the work you do in the world Oh, geez. That's a long story. Okay, what bits am I going to highlight for all of you? Um, I'll say I was born to radical parents. Um, I was born to radical parents. One, my dad was an addictions counselor um, who had rejected um, his religion uh, and was all about in the 80s researching how energy work could help addicts because he felt like the talking it over model would just circle you back in through the same conscious mind problem so my dad was actually researching um energy work in the 80s so this is sort of the environment i grew up in Um, my parents were both really into prosperity consciousness Um, I was practicing yoga at six years old in my mom's bedroom from like this really cool like ABCs of yoga book. I really think you guys should check it out. Like Google that stuff. It's so old school. And I think she has a 1D like leotard. So like do it. It's worth the leotard at least. Um, And then I started to search. I started to search around eight years old. Um, we moved to small town Alberta when I was six. Um, and so I went from city schools to like small town schools and that was a whole trip and a half. And our town didn't even have a Catholic school. And the Catholic school opened up when I was in grade four. My mom decided it would be a good time for me to get baptized and go to this school. And so I, there was one little white church, Catholic church on the one side of the train tracks, like the train ran right by it. It was very like small town, Alberta, picturesque kind of thing. And now that church is huge, by the way. And so is the town. So not the same as what I grew up with, but I went into that church and I remember feeling this sense at eight years old of like wanting to belong to something being very curious about religion and spirituality um and i didn't find it there (laughs) Mm -hmm. so by the time i got into catholic high school i was completely rebelling uh against the teachings i was always questioning i had been taught to always question from my parents um I felt like I would even refuse because I don't know if if all of you know, but in Catholic school, you can't graduate without religion. How weird is that? It sounds creepy to say it even. Um, So even if Alberta said I could graduate, I wouldn't be able to graduate from that school without religion. So here I am in a 30 level religion course, and they're telling me to translate the Bible literally. And I took great pleasure in calling 
teachers out on their hypocrisy at that age. And so I said, I'm not doing this assignment. And they're like, well, you have to do this. Assignment. And I'm like, no, you tell me in one hand not to take the Bible, Bible literally. And then you want me to literally take the Bible literally in your worksheet and hand it in for marks. Like, this is ridiculous. And so I refused. And then um, I guess it caught up with me because there was a threat of me not passing religion. And if I didn't pass, I wouldn't graduate with my friends. And, you know, teenagers, they have to graduate with their friends. And don't worry, I've broken that paradigm. I homeschool my kids. Like, they don't even care when they graduate. So that's a whole other like, generational thing. <laughs> We're generational um, breakers. Like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. My mom was a school teacher. So there's, like, a lot of, like, generational breaking up stuff happening. Um, so anyway, I, I got to do I had to do a special project actually to be able to graduate <laughs> is what it came down to <laughs> so that was sort of my upbringing and then in high school I think part of the rebellion was feeling like I knew something I knew something in here and I knew what didn't feel like truth with me and I'd, so I would sort of act out and be like this is garbage in this like teenage kind of way but really it was sort of like, why can't I reconcile this? And why can't I understand it? And why doesn't it make sense to me? And so actually at the time, my boyfriend's brother was reading conversations with God and they were not religious at all. And I made fun of him for reading that book because I'd never heard of it. And I was like, what are you turning Christian dude? Like I would make fun of him he was such a philosopher and it shocked me to see him reading this and he goes you should really read it and I thought yeah right you know and then I read it and so I read conversations with God all three of them at 17 years old and it blew the lid off my head like <laughs> I was not the same person I realized that Neil Donald Walsh had put all my beliefs in black and white and every sentence felt like a confirmation for me. And so I, what I had felt in here was now being translated through language, right down to the man-made devil, you know, that the devil was man-made, because that I couldn't reconcile either. And so that blew the doors off. And I think, you know, I started seeing things way differently. Um, I remember like being a teenager laying on the grass looking up at the stars and I wrote this whole poem about you know us being like insects that were in this you know container that just had like the air holes poked in it and who were we really you know and so that was sort of like my thought process at 17 years old um so ended up dancing with the toxic masculine as we do mary you talked about your bad boy phase <laughs> um that boyfriend whose brother introduced me um to conversations with god there was a lot of garbage there there was um uh like i gave up my virginity because all the other girls were doing it and he was cheating on me and then had ditched me for the girls so I basically slept with him to get him back and it worked for a time but I had like I had abandoned myself to manipulate mm -hmm. because I really wasn't ready for that experience at 16 years old you know um and so I and then I I got I think it rocked me and then um I went down this dark path and he ended up breaking up with me again. And this was just like my first, like really heartbreak, you know, like he was kind of my first love and it was that first experience of heartbreak. I remember staying in bed for five days because I just couldn't get out of bed. And my dad actually came in and ripped the sheets off my head. And he's like, it's time for you to get up now. Like <laughs> my dad. five days is enough, you know? <laughs> and so then I ended up going down a dark path. There was a guy who was uh, watching me um, with all this stuff happening. 
and he saw me get more and more vulnerable because we'd all hang out at the same coffee shop. I didn't know him at the time. Um, and he came up to me and would start to feed me information about this other guy and say like, this is who he's dating now. This, and so I started to lean on him for this information. Um, long story short, um, at 18 years old, um, I was sexually assaulted by him. That sent me on another spiral. I ended up in counseling. Um, and then I got back together with this boyfriend because he believed me. And he was the only one who believed this happened to me. So we got back together at 19 years old, but he was still a cheater. Like he was like a serial cheater. Okay. So I ended up moving in with him at 19 years old because I needed to keep an eye on him. Okay. And I was, I was so far, the pendulum had swung so far into the spiritual realm. <laughs> I'm so much more grounded now. <laughs> that I actually believe that if I had unprotected sex and just didn't want a baby, like that would be enough. Okay. So that's my thought pattern at 19 years old. Plus I was so sovereign and such a free spirit that I believed that the universe would never put that on me. Cause that would be like a death sentence for me, you know? So that's fine. We have one more, him and I have one more, you know, intimate encounter before I moved out because I was so sick of his garbage. So basically we had one more hurrah on like Halloween and I left like two days later, moved out, packed up my stuff, was done. So that's fine. Um, anyway, things started happening and I started getting really sick and I had no clue that morning sickness was different than all that was the same as all day sickness. So like when I started getting sick, I started to think morning sickness can't be this bad. Like I have the flu or whatever. Anyway, I, because I was like really into healers and I'd had white coat syndrome my whole life, I started seeing a healer who told me I wasn't pregnant. Although I had taken two pregnancy tests that said I was, two of them, she told me I wasn't, and she said that I had a fungal infection in my uterus that was causing that hormone to come up like I was pregnant, but I wasn't. Guess which answer I was willing to take. Oh, no. Because the universe would never put that on me. So now I went into the belief that I wasn't pregnant, I was sick. And so for nine months, I was on an antifungal diet. Um, I was on black cohosh, which is actually a herb for easy births. I didn't know this till after. I was on Siberian ginseng, which you should never take during pregnancy, but apparently my body wanted it. Um, I probably lived out like the healthiest 10 months of my life at that age, because I was only 19, 20-ish. Um, and this was my... You know, I'd already been like sort of spiritually awakened my whole life, but this was like my big awakening in life. <laughs> so um, I had continued to hang out during this time with friends of the guy who assaulted me and they were all drug addicts. And I realized um, part of my path was to try to heal drug addicts. I'm just going to tell you people who may not know that doesn't work. You can't fix them. <laughs> but I was young and tried okay and so I would never take the drugs with them but guess who they threw them at when the police came mm. me so I just got really lucky that I never got in trouble um because I was the sober one uh anyway so July 4 actually July 3rd 2003 I start feeling something. And by the way, through this time, like obviously movement was happening. I could feel movement. And so at those stages I was saying, uh, like, am I really not pregnant because I feel movement? And she would say, no, fungal infections move, go look it up. 
And I said, do they move that much? Like, this is moving a lot, you know? Anyway, so I started to have all these questions. And on July 3rd, which was a Friday, no, Thursday, I had decided to go see my family doctor despite my white coat syndrome on Monday, okay? So I was like, I'm going to finally get a second opinion on Monday because my mom convinced me they would just listen for a heartbeat. That was it. And I was like, okay, if I can do that, I can do that. So Thursday night, I start feeling something (laughs) and it felt like cramping, like period cramps. And I had been told that this fungal infection was going to release like an afterbirth. So I'm not thinking anything as I'm cramping. I'm thinking I'm getting better. Okay. So I start cramping later in the day. um, I talked to my sister on the phone and I was starting to have to breathe through cramping and like take breaks while talking to her. Okay. By one in the morning. So this was July 4th now. Um, my cramping was so intense that I asked my mom to take me the next town over to go to the hospital because there was no hospital in my town. And I said, you have to take me to the hospital. Like, this is terrible. Um, what I didn't know is that I was actually transitioning. I know that now, but I was transitioning then. So this was like serious piggyback contractions. And what the beautiful thing was before she took me to the hospital, I was leaning on my bed, on my forearms, my body was rocking, like, you know, doing all these things that I wasn't thinking about. Wow. They take me to the hospital. I get to the hospital. They pull up in the emergency thing and all of a sudden the pain switches and I don't have the pain anymore. I just have to go to the bathroom, which is a red flag. So my mom for some reason, turns around and drives 20 minutes all the way back home. And so by the time I got home, she was literally crowning as I was walking to the house. So we lived in a bi-level. I had the whole basement to myself. So we go down to the basement and my mom's with me. My dad was upstairs doing something. And my my, I'm looking because I'm feeling something weird and I'm looking and I'm thinking fungal infection. And if you've never seen a baby come out of a vagina, you may not expect them to look the way they do. And so I'm thinking fungus. And so I'm like, what is that? And my mom's going, I don't know what that is. Cause my mom was in the generation of you don't look at your birth. So nobody knew what was happening. And then she basically like whooshed out of my body. Oh my God, this is the craziest yeah. story ever. Okay. Right? Wow. And so I give birth to this baby, like, and I didn't know what to do with her. Like, I'd never held a baby. So my mom is screaming for my dad. Um, my dad comes flying down and sees this baby. And I said, I don't know what to do. And he rips off his shirt and he picks her up himself and holds her skin to skin. Aww. I know. Umbilical cord still attached, of course. So he like calms my mom down. He's like, you need to call 911 and I'll stay with Sam and the baby. <laughs> Thank you so for the masculine presence in our life. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And they, yeah. him and her still, like they still play crib every weekend. Like they're like bonded, bonded. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, my mom starts the towels in the dryer. And because I lived in a small town, every single firefighter and every single paramedic had to come check this out because they didn't have anything else to do what town was this this is okotoks this is okotoks okay Mm -hmm. Okay. but it was like it's way bigger now but at the time it was actually a town um and so uh they all come in and i must have been like high off the you know hormones because every firefighter had a name that started with J and it was bizarre. And I was noticing this. So they're all introducing themselves and I'm like, your names all start with J. And then the one guy's like, my name's Chris. And I'm like, no, I can't, I can't be friends with you. Cause you don't, you're not starting with a J and they're like looking at me and they're like, you need to lie down. I'm like, nah, I'm fine. And I'm literally holding on to the umbilical cord because I cut it with manicure scissors. So I'm like clamping it myself. Like, nah, I'm fine. And they're like, no, you need to lie down. 
<laughs> so I, I did. Um, anyway, they ended up like rushing me to Rocky View with Trinity and um, I spent like two days in that hospital with social workers wondering if I was going to keep her and all this like kind of stuff. And I had to like, she had no name. She had no diapers. Like she, like, <laughs> there was nothing. And so this was an important lesson of how the universe provides because um, my dad had said to me, cause I'm like, what am I going to do? And um, he's like, well, you're going to keep her, of course. Like, what do you mean? What are you going to do? And I said, well, I have no money to support her. And he's like, but we'll support you and her. And like, what, <laughs> there's no issue here. Like, what is your issue? <laughs> and I was like, oh, it was just mind blowing. And the support was amazing. Um, so I spent two days in the hospital trying to figure out her name. I had a good friend that we'd been friends since we were six. She was the first person I met in Oak Tokes. Um, my dad worked with her dad, all this kind of stuff. And she actually worked for a vet clinic. Now, this is terrifying a little bit, but, you know, don't let it get to you too much. She came in to see me at the hospital and wearing her scrubs because she, like, left work at lunch, which she found out and just, like, came on over. And uh, they had had her in the nursery this whole time because my situation was so weird. Now I see that that was a problem, but I didn't at the time. It did affect our breastfeeding relationship severely, but now I know better. Um, so anyway, she went in and like just grabbed her from the nursery. Like nobody questioned her because she was in scrubs. That's why I say it's like slightly terrifying, but you know, maybe they have better security now. I don't know. <laughs> um, and her and I sat with a baby book and like decided to name her. You know, so there was a real like sisterhood like naming her and that kind of thing it was really wild um so we named I named her Trinity um because I I was kind of thinking like triple goddess like in a way I was thinking of the holy trinity and um and I felt like her name had to be sacred you know and so uh that she changed my life I ditched the drug addicts right after that. I moved away from that town because you couldn't quite get away from the drug, drug addicts without leaving. Um, so my whole family moved. And, um, and so she changed my life. I decided to pull it together and stop trying to heal people I couldn't heal. And I went back to school and I got into psych at age 21, I guess, 22. So I had her at 20 and then I was in school by 22. Um, and it was at Mount Royal. So she was able to be in the daycare with me at school. So that was really cool. And I got into the psych program. And uh, three years into psych, I ditched it because there were too many boxes and I like freedom. <laughs> And I couldn't stand labeling people all the time. And so, yeah, there's a whole other story that happened there. But basically what I'll tell you is through divine intervention, I was put in contact with Austin Clark, who won the Governor General's Award for the Polished Toe. I had always been a writer my whole life. Uh, and I wrote a poem about him when he came to talk to us at the school because he, he made me starstruck, like the way he spoke and his gray dreadlocks and like he was just the coolest activisty kind of guy. And so I wrote about him because some friends couldn't make it. So I thought I'll write a poem and just like they'll know what he was like with this poem. And so I wrote it and they encouraged me to hand it off to my Ghanaian professor and because he was teaching me African lit at the time. And I was scared too, because I didn't want it evaluated, um, but I did, something came over me, like something not me came over me and I sent it. Next thing you know, he's cutting class early and he whispers in my ear, you're coming with me. And I thought, I'm, this is it, I'm, I have to know because curiosity drives my life. So I have to know, but what if he rapes or murders me? Like, this is so weird, right? <laughs> so I end up following him down the hallway. We go all the way up to the English tower, all the way up, all the way up, all the way back. The English faculty is empty, so no one can hear me scream. 
And I'm noticing that nobody's in their office. I'm like, this is it. This is where it ends. In the English faculty, knowing that I wanted to be a writer my whole life, but being afraid of it. And here I am. This is where my life ends. And he opens the door to the entire English faculty at the last possible room we could have gone in. They're all wearing suits. They're toasting Austin Clark with champagne flutes. And I'm standing there like a college bum with my toque on, my back. Like, I look like a college bum in this radiant, intellectual, creative space. And by the time it gets around to my professor, he says, I know, um, I know that it's against protocol for me to bring a student here, but I needed her to read her poem to Austin Clark. So the poem I wrote about Austin Clark, I'm now having to read it to him. A, it was a first draft, never been edited. B, I never intended this guy to see it. So here I am like shaking, trying to read this thing. Like I sound like an old man. And he comes up and he kisses each of my cheeks. Like it was like an out of body experience. Kisses each of my cheeks and he says, someday this name before me will be famous. And he said, I will stick this poem in my study in Toronto where it will distract me from the homelessness I see every day. Aww. And I was just like, who is this? Like, I'm looking behind myself like this isn't actually me. It felt totally out of body. Every single person in the English faculty shook my hand and I was really put in place with the advanced creative writing professor who said, I don't need to see another word you've written. I want you in my advanced creative writing class next semester. End of story. He had the dean beside him sign it off. He said, take this to the registrar. So I went into that class and I went into that class unprepared because these kids had already, kids, you know, young adults, had already been together for a semester. So I'm walking into this advanced creative writing class in the second half. And so it really put me on this path of healing creativity because I ended up getting wounded by this professor. This is a whole other story. Um, he ended up inviting me into his private group and, and there was some really subtle things happening that really systematically destroyed my creativity and I quit writing altogether for two years. Um, this was over the course of like 10 years, by the way. So um, anyway, I ended up switching my major is the whole point to that long story. So I actually graduated with honors with an English major. Now, in the last moment of that degree, oh, by the way, after I had Trinity, I trained as a doula. So I've been a doula since 2004. So I know like birth and vulvas and vaginas and the magic that happens through them very, very intimately. Um, I have seen many babies born since 2004, and that's been such a privilege. And so I meant to tell you that because the goddess is in there. And... I also met a friend who I was talking to Mary about before this, who introduced me to the goddess at age 21. She invited me to a goddess party where everyone was like dressed like goddesses. And some of these women that were at this party are still my best friends today. And I thought like, what is this? And there felt like freedom and juiciness to it. And then again, like I said, I danced with the toxic masculine with that creative story. And so in 2011, I ended up pregnant with a second baby and I was finishing my degree. So I gave birth to her and I had one more class to do after giving birth to her sideways in a bathtub, by the way, because she wouldn't turn. That's a whole other story. Um, very empowering though. Uh, so anyway, she, after she was born, I ended up um, having to finish my degree and I had one option left. So I was done like all the stuff I had to do. My one option, guess what I took everyone? I took a goddess mythology 400 level course, a women's studies. Oh so I got to finish my degree learning about goddesses. And actually the whole course was the systematic murder of the goddess through the bronze age. And that is such a painful story it hit me like a ton of bricks um to know that she was worshipped you know for 50,000 years and then through mythology through your own story she was eliminated from your narrative 
in 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 actual myth where she was murdered mm-hmm. and it's like if people ever que- like this is why for this time line or like 2020 i keep writing on social media question the narrative um amazingly she survived <laughs> and she's on the rise again and I had also taken many, many Hindu classes in my degree and Kali came up in all of them. And the one thing I learned about Kali was obviously Shiva is also associated with her. And Shiva, if you wanna know, you know, it represents our consciousness. Um, And my professor teaching it showed the picture of Kali with her foot on top of Shiva's corpse. And he said, now I'm just gonna show you this Basically what they're saying, what this myth means is the God cannot be anything without the goddess. And I went, I'm in, whatever that is, I want to learn all about it. So I took every Hindu class I could. (laughs) Sign me up. (laughs) Sign me up for that. Uh, So that was really how the goddess started to dance in my life. It was through academia, actually. And so once I hit that, finished that 400 level, got an A plus, by the way, high five me. Um, (laughs) And I think that set my path, not to mention I had given birth to two fierce girls, you know. And so life went on after that and it completely changed my trajectory. Um, I started being an entrepreneur after my little Aries was born and I started to heal the creative and then that's fine so I heal you know I'm healing that I'm still healing that creative wounding um but I'm working through that and I started um a writer's group called the writer's midwife and it was all about birthing creativity through inspiration zero critiquing I wasn't about feedback at that time I was about generation and generating um like flow and whatever and so I took women with me and that was very successful and the bookstore owners in Calgary gave me keys to their bookstore and the security code so like for like years I had the key to the bookstore you guys like do you know what that means like think about that for a second I had the key to all the knowledge you know Mm -hmm. like literally in my hand it was it was a powerful time and uh, I started to switch directions. I got into yoga and all that kind of stuff. And then Reiki showed up on my radar during yoga teacher training. And I took a, a weekend course. So this is where the Reiki part comes in. I took a weekend course and I felt nothing. So for an energetically sensitive person to take a weekend Reiki course and feel nothing coming out of it, there's probably an issue. Mm. So I ended up having to take it with my friend because she was the only one teaching it over the course of eight weeks. And I didn't want to confuse friendship with student teacher relationship. So I avoided that for a really long time. And then it was like, what choice did I have? So I took a year long training with her to become a Reiki master. In that time, I'd gotten a yoga job. Um, The manager of that yoga studio wanted a Reiki master. Uh, because her mom was a Reiki master. So she actually put me on the schedule because it was part spa, part yoga studio. And she put me on the schedule for the spa side as a, as their Reiki practitioner. And so I immediately started doing sessions on strangers, which is rare. Usually Reiki practitioners start out doing their friends and their family. And then eventually they, you know, hang that shingle. Hopefully Um, I got thrown in the deep end. It seems to be my life, like the birth, you know, like there's a trend here. Um, so I did that for a while. That was very eye-opening and I had to really trust myself. And I think all this time I never trusted myself because how can you trust yourself when you didn't know you were pregnant, Mm. when you thought the universe would support you in a specific way? Like, how could I ever again, believe my own intuition? Mm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And so there was a lot of healing to be done there. And so I I went on this path. I started teaching out of that studio, teaching Reiki out of that studio. And what happened? Oh, yeah. Goddess Reiki happened. Mm. 
So I'm teaching and I'm teaching and that, you know, and I, I, my friend opened up a center. And so I was teaching out of there in a physical space. And every time I taught a Reiki level, I felt like they were missing something. And it would haunt me. Like I would stay up at night being like, what am I missing? Like, why do I feel like they're not hitting these massive transformations like I want them to? Why is the light bulb not going on like I think it should? And I'm someone who, like I said, deep end. So I want people to um, break wide open, if that makes sense. And they weren't breaking wide open. And it bothered me. And my friend used to say, oh, Sam, you're just too attached to the tears. Like you're getting validation through tears. So if they're not crying, you're not thinking they're doing enough. And I knew it was more than that. Um, by the way, I'm not addicted to your tears. So if you want to be my student, like if you cry, it's okay. If you don't, it's okay too. Um, <laughs> that's not an expectation. Okay. Um, so I'm asking this question again and again, what am I missing? One day, I am watching my kids do sidewalk chalk. This is after I had my son, so healing masculine. Mm -hmm. um, and all of a sudden, I'm watching them do it, and I, I literally had this spontaneous download that said, you're supposed to teach goddess Reiki, and within five minutes, I had the entire curriculum. The oh. entire curriculum in five minutes. Yes, I love yes. it. Yes. Yes. And that's great. So I <laughs> I didn't know what I was getting into, by the way. <laughs> like when you devote yourself to the goddess, you don't know what you're getting into. And it, and if you want a wildly ecstatic, juicy, sensual, um powerful um delicious life you'll call her in Woo. if you <laughs> sign me up <laughs> yeah if you want to be boxed in and live in your white picket fence mary we talked about this if you want the picket fence if you want life to look a certain way and you have zero tolerance for surrender and letting something greater than yourself lead you then goddess the goddess isn't for you because yeah. she will she will inhale your white picket fence. <laughs> she will burn it down. <laughs> she'll burn it down. There's many myths. Like she'll eat it. She'll, you know, yeah. have a mace and like, you know, yeah. anyway. So I didn't pay attention to that. I just was like, I need to do this goddess Reiki. So I called my friend. I said, I need to do goddess Reiki. Uh, this was spring, of course, when new beginnings happen in summer i was starting a new level i said to her if you allow me to i will do goddess reiki out of the center if you will not allow me to i will be finding a new space she didn't like that i was excluding men uh, i never said i was excluding men i have never said that i'm excluding men if men are called to the goddess they are welcome they're mm -hmm. welcome they have an energetic womb space yeah you know we have it both within us you you talk about this all the time mary Mm -hmm. yeah. so I've never said I would exclude men men just don't seem right now and they will they're it's coming. coming yeah coming. they're just right now not drawn to that word yeah. but they will be yeah um plus we can't heal the masculine without healing the feminine think of Colleen and Shiva. first right and yes. then and then we get to a point of like okay I'm ready to feel safe in the masculine let's move into that wounding yes yeah. this is how it works so nothing about exclusion. Yeah. And so anyway, she reluctantly let me teach it out of there. And I had four students and I said to myself, if they're all in for this pilot project of Goddess Reiki, then we're doing it. So I go in, happened to be four women. I said, I know you thought you were taking Reiki, but how does Goddess Reiki sound? And they all said, like, amazing, count me in. The one student on that first day, she was the youngest student. I think she was only like 20, 21 at the time. She's like, I have to go to the bathroom. Um, my bra is really chafing me. I have to go take it off. So she goes to the bathroom to take off her bra. And I turn around and all the women in my class were just taking their bras off right there. And I thought, I'm home. Like this is what I was missing. 
-hmm. in every class. So I started teaching it. So basically, um, we teach the mother wound in level one root week. So like, this is not, you don't ease into this. <laughs> like, yeah, we're diving into the mother wound on day one. Um, day two, we're connecting to our cycles. We do mandalas, and this becomes a theme for all four levels of really listening to your cycles. Um, I'm so done with that PMS trope of, oh, you get cranky at this time. Of the you, do you know why you get cranky at that time of the month? Because you're trying to be in the masculine. Mm -hmm. The masculine is saying you still keep working through your through that first little bit of your period. You keep working, you keep doing, you keep on that 24 hour cycle that you've always been on and you get grouchy because you can't just sit still and, and move with your creative waters. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the grouchiness wouldn't even exist if you could follow your own cycle, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's what I teach is like really listening to that. And um, interestingly enough, let's cycle back to the Catholic Church, shall we? <laughs> so Mary Magdalene had been whispering to me. And if you don't know the true story of Mary Magdalene, let's just be honest, she was not a prostitute. She deserved more than two chapters in the Bible or whatever it is. Um, this is someone who was a priestess. Uh, my friend actually posted the Isis temple on her Facebook yesterday and said she was missing traveling. And I went, I can't believe I'm looking at the Isis temple right now. It's just, it's glorious. Um, Mary Magdalene um, was in the Isis temple. This is what Mary kind of wanted me to touch on was that Isis came from the star Sirius. And um, there was a lot of devotees um, Isis seems to work her way into everything. And if you call on Isis, I think even if you just call on her, it's so simple to access the goddess. You don't need a priest. You don't need an authority figure. Um, you can access her in four different ways. Prayer and prayer we're redefining right now in my goddess mythology course because people think that prayer is prescribed. Mm -hmm. Prayer is not prescribed. It's an ask and you shall receive type of deal. Um, so prayer ritual, like we always do altars to the goddess in day one of goddess Reiki. Um, and the altar is, is this place that you walk past and it catches you in the sacred. So that's why we do it. It's like, a, it's like a net for the sacred. It's like you walk past your altar that you created with intention and you see the candles on it and the crystals and the image of the goddess or whatever and the things that are you, and it'll catch you as you walk by, and you'll take a moment. You'll take that breath to drop into the sacred, and so the altar is really just not only a devotion, but it's a reminder to you to, to stop and drop in, mm. and the other way is, um, so I said prayer, ritual, meditation, of course, and in the meditation, you can just say Isis's name. You can just ask to connect with her and what I've noticed is women experience very, very similar experiences when they call on her, which is this feeling like her wings are wrapping around you. And it's bizarre how many people report the same feeling mm. without talking to each other. So that is so powerful that it can be like a physical experience, you know. Mm. And the fourth way to call on the goddess is through embodiment. So this is really what I teach. Like I can easily tell you to pray and meditate and all that stuff, but I teach you how to embody her through movement, through like living it, you know, this whole, like you are now this container for the divine feminine. And yeah, so, so I in, invite you to explore that with Isis. But anyway, back to Mary. So Isis, Sirius, Isis, Isis Temple. Now we have uh, Mary Magdalene, who's a priestess in the temple. We're talking a lot of tantric philosophy, which I also teach. And then Mother Mary was actually considered 
to be such a high priestess that she was thought to be the embodiment of Isis. And they, it, that is rare. And so they gave her high priestess status. So how freaking cool is that? Yeah. And then you have Mary Magdalene. So, so the story goes that Jesus was actually um, basically guided by Mary Magdalene. He was her, um, she was his spiritual advisor. And they had this sacred union, much like Shiva and Kali, Shiva Shakti, Shiva Parvati, whatever. They had that kind of sacred union. Um, you can have that sacred union. I teach that as well. Ryan and I are a conscious couple. That's my husband. And he and I often do soul gazing, checking in with each other that way. Our sex life is incredible. Like <laughs> the deepest and healthiest I have ever known. And it is so sacred. And I never understood that spiritual sacred sexuality um, connection because when you go to church, you're disconnected. Mm -hmm from that and it took me this many years but I get it now and it is unbelievable like you can manifest worlds by doing this work kind of like how they separated us by being able to contact the goddess or contact god by having to go through a priest to do so right mm. and there's some of this going on with the goddess circles like I really question people who say you have to pay me like three thousand dollars to access the goddess mm. no you don't mm -hmm. you don't even have to pay me to do reiki training to access the goddess like <laughs> i just told you how <laughs> it is you she's there right like she's there she's, she's there. there instantly she's here right now like i felt the the crown opening and whew, all of that huge huge. I had a friend, I hope she doesn't mind me telling this story. I had a friend the other day who had Kali literally woke her up. Kali crawled in bed with her. Like she thought Kali was next to her and came into waking and she wasn't. And Kali told her that she needed to devour her anxiety. Wow. Like this is a, this is a, this is a Reiki. This is someone who's worked with the goddess with me for two years now. Like it's, profound the stuff that comes into this so Mary Magdalene what does she have to do with this I go to a psychic I trust and at, this is after I also play singing bowls like the crystal tones like magical ones and I went to an expo to do Reiki there and my friends at Amaryllis like Amaryllis like fist pump if you want a bowl in Calgary go get one from Cochrane they're amazing Martha's amazing she's a total healer um, and they were there and they're friends of mine. And so, um, they were playing this pink bowl on the demo and I had for years, my sick, it's my sixth bowl. I saw it as pink and I don't love pink. So that's not the reason I was thinking pink. And so they were playing this pink bowl and I, I said, who is that? And it's a crystal bowl, like I said. And they're like, oh, it's um, it's an aura, like a pink aura gold bowl. Um, do you want to see the description on it? So I said, yeah. And again, I had been working with Mary Magdalene for about a year or two before that. And so I said, yeah, I want to see that. And I was even taking a Mary Magdalene course online at the time. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I want to see the description. In the description, it said, this bowl has Mary Magdalene energy. Wow. Now, I don't know if you know how much those bowls are. No. but they start at $1,500. So this rose aura gold one was about $2,500. That was my bowl. Did I have $2,500 that day? No. But somehow by the end of the day, I did. And I said, like, if, if this is for me, like, if this is for me, send it to me. And my husband came up with the money for me wow Amazing. that I didn't know we had you know like he just had a you know we we are very partnered on our money so it's not like I'm in that situation of like I don't know what's going on financially I know exactly what's going on financially he just happened to have stocks <laughs> Amazing. Amazing so she came to home with me that day and uh 
And by the way, all those bowls, because I said I had six of them, they've all been paid for without me spending a dime, including my first three. My grandma died and my grandma was very miserly and my she only willed the money to her four boys. And so it was up to the parents to divvy it out to the grandchildren if they thought thought it would be a fit or whatever. My parents were, you know, retired and renovating. So I did not think I would see a dime. They needed that money. My dad is, like I said, he's a tourist. He's very good with money. Did I tell him I spent money on those three, my first three bowls? Never. Well, I would never tell my dad that because he'd be like, you're out of your mind. I would put them on a credit card. And my dad gave me a check, which is unusual for him. He gave me a check for a bit of my grandma's inheritance. And it was the exact price of those three bowls. Amazing. Funny enough, one of those bowls was the grandmother, the grandmother bowl. So I was like, of course, my grandma would pay for the grandmother bowl. Yeah. Anyway, story about like money, goddess, energy, super cool. Yeah. So if you think you can't have those bowls, you can. If they want to come to you, they will. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So Mary Magdalene in the bowl. So I start playing that. And then this psychic I go to and she says you know, you know, you walked in with a Mary, right? And she pulls out an actual Christian tarot deck that she had. She goes, let me find her for you. It's this Mary. And she flips the card and it says Magdalene at the bottom. And I was like, yeah, of course I did. Of course I came in here. And she goes, yeah. And that's who gave you your goddess Reiki. Mm. And I was like, whoo. And whenever I call on her, even in goddess mythology, because she is that bridge between the divine and, and human, and, you know, she, she's the energy of exile and betrayal. And like, if you're trying to heal from sisterhood, call on her because she knows it all Mm. and, and she can be both. And so I find women just knowing that she's the bridge between human and divine they have massive openings when we call on Mary Magdalene and so it's really powerful I'm so grateful to her I actually you know when you grow up as a rebel in the church and you kind of question everything and you kind of start there you go through this period of like resenting it and in 2016 I did a manifestation walk um, with at the solstice with a bunch of women and the soul the manifestation walk led me to a catholic church here and as i was approaching the catholic church on this manifestation walk i looked up and i heard mary magdalene say to me you thought i was in the church but i wasn't and she said but remember they taught you everything you you didn't want to know so that you could seek everything you wanted to know. And in that moment, I was so profoundly grateful for that experience, for being in that container, because I was like, oh my gosh, I wouldn't have been such a seeker if they weren't so hypocritical. Like how grateful am I that they go against what I stand for, because then I would have sought what I stood for. Like you wouldn't have goddess Reiki if I hadn't been to the Catholic church. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. and don't let them fool you, you guys. Like those of you who are into like paganism and witch stuff, like they have, remember they have relics in the altar, like bones of saints are in the, like, let's not forget where they came from. You know, just saying, mm. just throwing that out there. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Which is really why I was drawn to the Catholic church in particular yeah. is because they're a bit witchy, even though they won't admit it. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's masked. There's so much illusion and there's so many veils. You have to know how to look between the layers. Yeah. Yeah. Which is funny that you just said veils because yesterday we just invoked for my level ones Inanna um, or Ishtar, same, same. Mm -hmm. And Inanna's myth is that she goes into the underworld and takes off the seven veils, right? Mm -hmm. And faces Ereshkigal, her sister, who, um, you know, murders her and hangs her on a hook, but then she's resurrected. So if you're wondering where the resurrection story came from, it came from a Sumerian myth. Mm. Um, But I just love that of like, this is the goddess, like you, you get unveiled and 
maybe you feel butchered by your sister, but it's all in the purpose of rebirthing into who you truly are without the veils. Mm. And who wouldn't want to go to the underworld for that? I, I don't want to be masked or fake or... Yeah, yeah. And we were talking about at the beginning of the call here before we pressed record how this year is very much about us learning who people truly are. It's very much the year of disclosure and the the veils are dropping, the illusions are dropping. And so it's so profound that those of us that have been working deeply with the goddess for a hot minute just to see how it's being reflected through the collective of the divine feminine is back and we know that masculine is a very grounded energy whereas the feminine is wild and chaotic and sensual and so when she comes in which we're seeing there's chaos and she is she's creating this chaos in order to uh, catalyze change and healing mm-hmm. you know yeah actually the coach i was working with told me i had a bit of an addiction to chaos and um and that's an aspect of the goddess. And I thought, yeah, I am. Fill your cup, man. Like, I'm going to fill it with chaos mm. and sort through that. And and because on the other side of chaos is order, but like the new order, mm. you know? How do you find um, Ryan grounds you in that mm-hmm. as he's your sacred union? Oh, how Ryan grounds me in that. So he, he is, oh, he's... Um, such a light in this world I think he he comes from severe trauma and severe religious trauma as well so he kind of threw all the baby out with the bathwater. so he's not like down with the goddess like I am but um what happens is I I I am eight fire out of 12 in my chart okay so (laughs) if anyone knows like what fires do this is me on an internal level all the time And so fire is really great because I can transmute things. Um, I'm also a catalyst for change, but it also gets me in the anger stuff. Like I can get really angry and I'm Kali when I'm angry. Kali, um, when Sati's father in the Hindu myth made fun of Shiva for being a drunk and all this kind of stuff. And he like shamed Shiva at their... I think it was a party or a wedding. I can't remember. There's so many Hindu myths in my brain. I get them confused. Anyway, she basically threw herself on the fire and like became her fierce form. So all these fierce goddesses started coming out of her. And oh no, that's the myth I was, no, I'm getting them mixed up. But that, yes, that did happen too. But then there was the one where all the gods are churning. I feel like they're doing that right now. They're churning. Um, the primordial sea and they're creating something so this is that chaos like they're turning they're turning and then shiva unearths some poison what are we doing you guys like we're unearthing poison right now and so shiva swallows it so this is good news shiva swallows it and it gets stuck in his throat and he starts choking and so kali comes in and she can't have her lover choking so she dives into his throat and she devours the poison and she gets completely off her ass drunk off of it. So she's completely intoxicated off this poison. She goes trouncing into the forest and she starts to get angry. And uh, Shiva goes and like tries to do this dance off thing and then it just makes her mad and she starts destroying everything in her path, everything. And one of, the Smith has several outcomes. One of them is that she sat on his erect penis and it satiated her, you know? And it's like, a lot of women hate that myth. Like, why do we need a penis to calm us down, right? Like, mm. we don't. But, so I have a yoga teacher from New York who's like, I love her so much. Um, Kelly Cam, she's amazing. But she was going through this mythology and she's like, this pisses me off. And so I spoke up about it and I said, I actually have a Shiva. Like, I married my Shiva. And he does soothe me because when I'm on a war path like that, I can hurt my children. I can be nasty to my dogs. Like, you know, I can be Kali, but he always stands on the sidelines like this yogi. And he just looks at me because he also understands fire and anger. And he just looks at me and goes, Sam, there's another way. And just with him saying that, I'm immediately like, back in my body I'm not drunk off rage and fury anymore 
and I'm like oh yeah like there's another way so this is like indicative of how our relationship is you know and and the only reason I can buy into that is because he understands rage as intimately as I do you know Mm -hmm. Plus, like, he gets a lot of benefits from me exploring Tantra and Jade Egg and, like. <laughs> all down. He's all down. He's like, yeah, baby. But he'll, like, soul gaze with me. And I don't, I, don't, I don't mean that as in I feel there's an ulterior motive with him because he gets something on the spiritual intimacy level that he can't otherwise. Mm-hmm. So it's not like, oh, I think there's a happy ending at the end of this. He doesn't go into it like that. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's uncomfortable you guys you know how uncomfortable soul gazing is you're not going to do it even if there's a happy ending on the other side because it it gets you so emotional yeah absolutely so that's kind of how he's my shiva um and how he grounds me with that was he always really open to like exploring tantra and exploring like he was you didn't have to ease him into it he's just all hands on this is a man who okay so remember i was sexually assaulted I actually, a result from that through all the years of healing and counseling, I was still numb physically. So any sexual relationship I'd have after that, I would just tell people like, you're never going to get an orgasm out of me. Like I can't feel anything. So if you're okay with that, whatever. And it was true. Like I physically couldn't feel anything. So when I met him and it was very cosmic how I met him, I met him in my town. Actually, I wasn't living there, but I met him there because my friend wanted to hook up with her first love and they were at a bar and it, we went to this bar and he was the only one I didn't know. And uh, we started talking because we both had children the same age and that was very rare to find. So we were both single parents and both of our girls were three at the time. And so we started bonding over like, being parents at such a young age and so that was fine we went on our first date like three days later and um we immediately at that first date was like that the rest was history like we moved in four months later um but what he said to me in those first three weeks of like sexual exploration was I told him the same story I'm broken I'm numb forget it And he goes, he said something no one else had ever said to me. And he goes, we'll see. And he, little did I know, had been studying Taoist sexuality for years. Like years. And so he knew more about my body than I did. And I had a through the roof orgasm within three weeks with him. Wow. And still to this day, we've been married 10 years. It'll be 11 in June. And he, I still hit the roof every single time, like every single time. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, so and, beautiful. and he, and he made it so that I didn't have to even self pleasure. Like he's so good at what he does. I didn't even need to do that. But I started with the jade egg after, after I met Alice Hong for Untamed and we had to explore nakedness in all its forms, which I didn't know. And I almost quit that course because of it, because it pushed me right to the brink and, and it cracked me wide open. That, that course cracked me wide open. Um, And it was all with sisterhood. It wasn't with men. Um, And so coming off that, I went into Layla Martin and became like really into her stuff and started with her jade pleasure course. And I really realized that our power is found through self-pleasuring. Like you can have the most amazing lover like I do, and you will find so many other worlds through self-pleasuring. And you can, like I said, there's, um, there's like a whole sex magic thing that you can do where you bring the energy up and up and up and up, which is also like a Taoist thing as well. Um, and that will like blow your mind. I mean, almost literally, like I thought I was going to lose my head in those kind of practices, but um, extremely powerful. And he's the one that held space for that. He's the one for years that said, I think you should keep going with your own self-pleasuring because that was a, what I wouldn't do after I was assaulted. Mm-hmm. And I think it has to do with shame and it has to do with those layers And I healed a lot using that jet egg. Like you cry a lot, you grieve a lot, you find your power, you know, in places that in, and in an expansive way that you didn't think you would. And then, you know, you know how much power you have. And it was him who encouraged me to do that. 
Amazing. You know? Yeah. Yeah. What I found um, was that for me to be able to have an orgasm, I had to trust the man I was with and I had to be with him in like an actual, like a, a, a relationship. Like even if I was, you know, with the same partner for a while, if we weren't actually emotionally invested in each other and there was no way that I would be able to open myself up enough to receive him that way to trust myself to let go to allow the the orgasm to go through and I think that's right? there's a lot of women that that do not experience orgasms it, with their partner it's only with self-pleasure so what what would you say to that woman that's never had an orgasm with a partner other than self-pleasure Oh, I think, I think it would be so individual. I think, I think I would ask so many questions, Mm -hmm. like, like what would their relationship be like? Like you said, on an, on an emotional intimacy level, like how much do they open up to each other? Mm -hmm. Um, There, there is the trust thing. Um, There is, I mean, are you telling, are you communicating? Are you communicating what you need are you able to receive that's a huge one and I do that in Reiki as well I have women create a nest for each other and they have to rub coconut like all the sisters are rubbing coconut oil onto one sister do you know how many people break open and cry when they're receiving that without any like I don't have to give back to you there's a power in that so maybe like trying an exercise with your partner if you're really wanting to explore that of be the one that just receives Mm -hmm. like make an agreement where he doesn't receive anything in return we are so conditioned to think that our bodies were made for male pleasure do you know how much it has to flip your conditioning on its head to receive pleasure from males and that be it Mm. that's a whole other thing so you could have you know old programs running that i am made for men's pleasure Mary Magdalene's a great one to work with that because what if you have prostitution archetype, right? Of like, you know, that can play into your money story too. Like if you think you're a prostitute, are you just giving yourself away in all aspects? Mm -hmm. And you may not define, I don't mean literal prostitute. I just mean the archetype. Yeah. I I would Um, say that on some level, all of us are carrying that within us. We do you know, like, because of our past lives, you know, and, you know, like, there's, even for myself, when I moved across the world to be with my now husband, he was taking care of all the bills when I first moved over here, and so I, right away, like, okay, well, then I have to make sure the house is clean, that he, like, his laundry is done, you know, that everything, like, food is cooked, you know, and I just automatically went into that, it was just you know, and so I had to work through my own thing to be able to open myself up to receive his, yeah. his financial support because, hey, I just moved across the world for this guy. He's going to he's gonna hold me while I get myself settled and rooted and I, I am worthy of receiving that. But that was my own like work that I had to do. So I could just talk to you all day. <laughs> I know. Just a couple more questions about Goddess Isis before we wrap up and then also to hear about just how people can find you and if you offer mm-hmm. sessions by a distance for those that aren't in the Calgary area. So what would you, when you want to work with Isis, why, like what certain things would you want to evoke her for? Isis is the one you would evoke for anything. And the reason I say that is she is like the ultimate mother goddess. It feels like everything came from her. Um, And so she is like, I think she's all encompassing, all encompassing. I think if, you know, for like Kali, for instance, you would call on her if you want to break patterns. If you're like, I'm so done with this conditioning. I'm so done with it. Then you call on her for that specifically. But Isis is anything and you can't go wrong with her and she I love calling on her when I need to feel strength because she can be that I love calling on her when I need to feel safe like ever woken up from a nightmare and you just look around and you're kind of like I'm freaked out right now I call on her and I could just feel her like swoop in and create this container that I don't have to be afraid in anymore um yeah, I mean, anything that the mother could give you, mm-hmm. you know, 
comfort, nurturing, sustenance. Ask her for help with money. Ask her for help with even your relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, she is, she is all. Yeah. Yeah. I think coming into my life specifically for business mentorship. Cool. Yeah. So uh, like when I, a shamanic journey and I end up going up to the cosmos to see her and often it's like, I see black and gold, which is really funny that I'm wearing these colors today. Yeah, you- <laughs> I just noticed when I put my leg up, I'm like, Hey, these are black and gold. But that's like goddess color or Isis colors. Um, but yeah, she's, she's coming in to, she drops exactly what I, like she drip feeds, like four steps that I need to do in my business. And it's so clear. It's never come in that clear before. And with her just bang on as well as wealth consciousness. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh man. I mean, the Egyptians were delicious for that. Like they knew wealth and knew how to receive it. And we can't do our work. Like if you're having blocks where you're like, but I don't, I'm not into money. Like, I don't need money. I'm not interested in my, like, I've heard so many people say that to me and I'm going, do you know how much good you can do right now? Cause unfortunately that is what our currency is right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it's like, you could do so much good with so much more. Yeah. Wealth needs to be in the hands of conscious people right now because our emotions are not getting cleaned up with the help of government. It's our our cleaned up with these little 16 year old geniuses that have figured out how to like break down plastic and stuff. And it's conscious people that have wealth in their hands that are investing in these, these systems to help clean up our oceans because our government got it. Yeah. I mean, and it's coming back into the hands of the light workers. I really believe that we are so cared for. Like, you know, I have not played into the story at all that the economic downturn that we may be foreseeing with this, situation we're in will affect my business because I know that I'm on God's payroll. I know that I'm a divine priestess and I am being massively compensated for the work that I do. And we are so being taken care of Our, us light workers. We will receive everything that we need and more in order for us to do what we came here to do. And if you're like me, where you've had so much struggle in that department in the last 10 years, like I've struggled so hard and got myself in a mess with debt and and just could not manifest it like I felt like how do I know all this stuff about manifesting and and receiving and it and it just would like trickle in but like a trickle and what I realize now that it's 2020 is that was my initiation and I kept Isis kept telling me for the last you know at least six years she's like you're going through an initiation and that was the word I kept hearing with her And in the last six months, I've stopped hearing that word and money is now flowing to me easily, but I had to get down on my knees. I wouldn't have leaned into ISIS without that scarcity. Mm, Do you know what I'm saying? So if for those light workers who are struggling right now, it's just so that it's like breaking the ego down in such a big way. And it's ancestral truth too. Like that's like, Wealth consciousness and root chakra work go hand in hand. And it's something that you, no matter what level of income you're at, you have to continue to do your wealth consciousness work every single week. Not like 10 minutes a week, talking a few times a week, four or five times a week for like 10, 15 minutes. Like, you know, staying on top of that because as light workers, we have a hard time being in our bodies. We have a hard time being in our root chakra. And our root chakra is our ability to manifest in the material plane and really take care of our stuff, our financial stuff. So that goes, that all goes hand in hand. And it does. when I go see Isis or when she calls me up, she always sits me down on her throne and gives me a root chakra activation. Yes. <laughs> yes. That is the thing about her is she's so divine, but so grounded. Mm-hmm. Like I feel right here, right now when I call on her. Yes, absolutely. You know? Beautiful. Well, my dear, let us know how we can find you. Do you offer sessions via Zoom? Can you take your goddess school via Zoom as well? Tell us how people can find you and learn more about you. Well, thank you to the coronavirus for moving me 100% online. So I just did my first uh, virtual attunements during this quarantine, and I'm going to be honest, they were more powerful than an in-person. Um, I, I guess there's no time and space. Like, I know, I know there isn't, but it's like, 
again, if we needed more proof that there's no time and space, these attunements, like I said, for these students were more powerful than one in person. Um, I've always given distance sessions. That's not new. Um, private one on one. I always pull cards with them. I always um, do Reiki, of course, but I always, there's, I'm called to other things. I really listen to divine pouring into me. Sometimes I'll chant mantras over you. Like it, it just depends what I'm called to um, in that moment. And uh, distance is not new. So yeah, anyone all around the world can zoom in we, with me. That's totally fine. Um, if you're like in on the North American continent, we could do it over the phone too, you know? Um, and yeah, you can take classes. My new level one won't be up until the fall though. So, cause I'm doing two classes already. So um, I won't have like the sacred space for that until the fall. Um, and I'm doing a goddess mythology course right now for 13 weeks. We're in week four, but I've recorded it all. So it's stupid cheap. Mary would probably slap my hand. It's only 44 Canadian dollars for 13 weeks, but that was just my gift to humanity during this time. Um, so basically you're getting 13 classes for the price of one. Wow. Uh, so if you wanted to jump in on that, you got nothing to lose and I can send you the four recordings already. Amazing. So Amazing. Um, that's ongoing right now. And there's been, like, I thought, okay, this is for people who maybe don't want to learn the energy work, but just want to know about the myths. And I, it's just like blowing the doors off people. Like, I was like, <laughs> so. Amazing. What time are you, what time of the day are you doing these trainings for the goddess mythology? So that is 10 a.m. on Friday mornings. Mountain standard time. Mountain oh, standard time. All right. I am in for that goddess mythology 100%. Yes, you are. Send me the invoice. I'm in. I am so, hey. so I will send you the link. <laughs> and oh, you can find me on Instagram at goddess Ricky YYC. You can find me on Facebook at goddess Ricky YYC. And you can check out the website at www.goddessreikiyyc.net. Super. Super. Thank you, Sam, for spending so much time with me today. Before we even hit record, we'd already chatted for like an hour. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we've been having such a great time. <laughs> right? So much fun. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who was listening. And yes. this is yes. profound. So yeah. amazing. I felt so much energy moving through me. A lot of crown activations were happening. And when we were having our conversation, I loved it. And my womb definitely had a lot of heat. It still does still definitely yes does. yeah yes the womb, mm -hmm. the womb. Mm -hmm. so amazing thank you so much sam have a beautiful rest of the day mm -hmm. this you will too. be up on my podcast on tuesday and other ways people can catch the recording on my business page here until then yay please send it to me that would be awesome super super much love have a great sunday and thank you so much you thank are you. a wealth of wisdom oh thank you so much mary it was such an honor like a true honor Bye.